So we're here with uh, chapter. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I forgot my microphone. Ta. Okay. So we're here at um, chapter six, hundreds of people. Okay, so before we begin, I want you to read. Shh, I am busy, Chanel. Somebody wants to join class. He's bored. <laughs> okay, so... So we are already in this chapter. It's called Hundreds of People. So I want you to read first before I proceed. You can pause this. So you can read uh, The Quiet Lodgings all the way to Dr. Manette at Home, uh, which is the first line of Jarvis Laurie. So pause. Okay. Okay. Dr. Manette at Home. Expected home. Miss Lucy at home? Expected home. Miss Pross at home? Possibly at home, but of a certain certainty impossible for handmaid to anticipate intentions of Miss Pross as to admissions or denial of the fact. As I am at home myself, said Mr. Lorry, I'll go upstairs. Although the doctor's daughter had known nothing of the country of her birth, she appeared to have innately derived from it that ability to make much of little means, which is one of the most useful and most agreeable characteristics. Simple as the furniture was, it was set off by so many little adornments um, of no value but for their taste and fancy, that its elegance, that its effect was delightful. The disposition of everything in the rooms, from the largest object to the least, the arrangement of colors, the elegant variety and contrast obtained by thrift and trifles, by delicate hands, clear eyes, and good sense, were at once so pleasant in themselves and so expressive of their originator, that as Mr. Lorry stood looking about him, the very chairs and the tables seemed to ask him, with something of that peculiar expression which he knew so well by this time, whether he approved. There were three rooms. Okay, but, uh, read here until the first line again of Mr. Lorry. Pause. I wonder, said Mr. Lorry, pausing in his looking about, that he keeps that reminder of his sufferings about him. Oh, so he was wondering uh, if um, why the doctor kept the the shoemaking the shoemaking. The shoemaking stuff, like the one that says there that he had a shoemaker's bench and a tray of tools. He was, uh, Mr. Laurie was kind of wondering why the doctor, why the doctor decided to keep those stuff. Now, it was, it was such a reminder of, of his suffering in the Bastille because that was his occupation in the Bastille. Okay. I wonder, said Mr. Laurie, pausing in his looking about, that he keeps that reminder of his sufferings about him. And why wonder at that was the abrupt inquiry that made him start. Random, it proceeded from Miss Pross, the wild red woman, strong of hand, whose acquaintance he has first made at the Royal George Hotel at Dover, and had since improved. I should have thought, Mr. Lorry began. Pooh, you'd have thought, said Miss Pross, and Mr. Lorry left off. How do you do, inquired that lady then, sharply, and yet as if to express that she bore him no malice. I am pretty well, I thank you, said, answered Mr. Lorry, with meekness. How are you? Nothing to boast of, said Miss Pross. Ugh, leg. Indeed, ah, indeed, said Miss Pross. I am very much put about, put out about my ladybird. Indeed. For gracious sake, say something else beside indeed, or you'll fidget me to death, said Miss Pross, whose character, dis dissociated from stature, was shortness. <laughs> In it, oh, oh, so Miss Pross gonna was a very... Um, Despite being a large, kind of a stout woman, she was very short of patience. Really then, said Mr. Lorry, as an amendment, really is bad enough, returned Chanel, returned Miss Pross, but better, yes, I am very much put out. May I ask the cause? I don't want dozens of people who are not at all worthy of Ladybird to come here looking after her, said Miss Pross. So, nagyaw si Miss Pross. Kay people kono keep going to the house 
and he she doesn't think that they are worthy of the attention of Ladybird. Do dozens come for that purpose? Hundred, said Miss Pross. It was characteristic of this lady, as of some other people before her time and since, that whenever her original proposition was questioned, she exaggerated it. Dear me, said Mr. Lorry, as the safest remark he could think of. I have lived with the darling, or the darling has lived with me and paid me for it, which he cer certainly should never have done. That may take your affidavit if I could have afforded to keep either myself or her for nothing, since she was ten years old. Then it's really very hard, said Miss Pross. Not seeing with precision that what was very hard, Mr. Lorry shook his head, using that important part of himself as a sort of fairy cloak that would fit anything. All sorts of people who, people who are not in the least worthy of the pet are always turning up. So, tagan ko nuka ig mga tao nga visiting Lucy and Miss Pross was like, yeah, but they're not really worthy of her. When, uh, said Miss Pross, when you begin it, I began it, Miss Pross, didn't you? Who brought her father to life? Oh, if that was beginning it, said Mr. Lorry. It was ending it, I suppose. I say, when you began, it was hard enough. Not that I have any fault to find with Dr. Manette, except that he is not worthy of such a daughter, which is no imputation for him, for it was not to be expected that anybody should be under any circumstances. But it really is doubly and trebly hard to have crowds and multitudes of people turning up after him. I could have forgiven him to take Lady Bird's affections away from me. Mr. Lorry knew Miss Pross to be very jealous, but he also knew her by this time to be, beneath the service of her eccentricity, one of those unselfish creatures found only among women who will, for pure love and admiration, bind themselves willingly slaves to youth when they have lost it, to beauty that they never had, to accomplishments that they were never fortunate enough to gain, to bright hopes that never shone upon their own somber lives. He knew enough of the world to know that there is nothing in it better than the faithful service of the heart, so rendered and so free from any mercenary taint that had such an exalted respect for it, that in the retributive arrangements made by his own mind, we all make such arrangements more or less. He stationed Miss Pross much nearer to the lower angels than many ladies immeasurably better got upon by nature and art, who had balances that tells him. There are, I'm um, sorry, pause. And then continue all the way to um, as we happen to be alone for the moment. Pause. As we happen to be alone for the moment and are both people of business, he said when they had got back to the drawing room and had sat down there in friendly relations, let me ask you, does the doctor in talking with Lucy refer to the shoemaking time yet? So Mr. Laurie is asking if the doctor kind of talks about his shoemaking days, which is in clear reference to his Bastille days. Like, does he talk about it to her? Never. So he, he does not he does not bring it up. And yet keeps that bench and those tools beside him. Ah, returned Miss Pro, shaking her head. But I don't say he don't offer it within himself. Do you believe that he thinks of it much? I do, said Miss Pross. Do you imagine, Mr. Lorry had begun, when Miss Pross took him up short with, Never imagine anything. Have no imagination at all. I stand corrected, do you suppose? You go so far as to suppose sometimes. Now and then, said Miss Pross. Do you suppose, Mr. Lorry went on with a laughing twinkle in his bright eye as it looked kindly at her, that Dr. Manette has any theory of his own preserved through all those years relative to the cause of his being so oppressed, perhaps even to the name of his oppressor? So Mr. Lorry was kind of fishing for information saying, do you think Mr. Laurie know? Uh, not Mr. Laurie. Miss Doctor Manette knows the who caused his being incarcerated in the Bastille for a long time. Does he know who who made him suffer in such a way? Does he talk about that? Chanel. Chanel. Okay. Now. Hi. Bad girl. Okay. I don't suppose anything about it What, but what Lady Bird tells me. And that is that she thinks he has. So Lucy has a feeling that her dad knows who did the injustice 
on him, like who did him the injustice. So Lucy really believes that Dr. Manette knows. Now, don't be angry at my asking all these questions because I am a mere dull man of business and you are a woman of business. Dull? Miss Pross inquired with placidity. Rather wishing his modest adjective away, Mr. Lorry replied, no, 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 surely not. Uh, to return to business. Okay. Okay. Pause. And then, oh, wait, wait. Go to... Um, Hmm, go to, hold on, on Sundays, okay? So pause and then we will start again on on Sundays. On Sundays, Miss Pross, <laughs> Chanel, <laughs> okay. On Sundays, Miss Pross dined at the doctor's table, but on other days, persisted in taking her meals at unknown periods, either in the lower regions or in her own room on the second floor, a blue chamber to which no one but her lady bird um, ever gained admittance. On this occasion, Miss Pross, responding to Lady Bird's pleasant face and pleasant efforts to please her, unbent exceedingly, so the dinner was very pleasant too. It was an oppressive day, and after dinner, Lucy proposed that the wine should be carried out under the plane tree, and they should sit there in the air. As everything turned upon her and revolved about her, they went out under the plane tree and she carried the wine down for the special benefit of Mr. Lorry. She had installed herself some time before as Mr. Lorry's cup bearer. And while they sat under the plane tree talking, she kept his glass replenished. She's bored. Are you bored? Okay. Mysterious backs and ends of houses peeped at them as they talked, and the plane tree whispered to them in its own way above their heads. It's getting restless. Still, hundreds of people did not present themselves. Mr. Darnay presented himself while they were sitting under the plane tree, but he was only one. So, di malagi hundreds, pero over kasi Miss Pross. But Mr. Darnay arrived after dinner while they were in the plane tree. Dr. Manette received him kindly, and so did Lucy. But Miss Pross suddenly became afflicted with a twitching in the head and body and retired into the house. She was not unfrequently the victim of this disorder, and she called it in unfamiliar conversation a fit of the jerks. The doctor was in his the doctor was in his best condition, okay? Um pause. Oh no, not pause yet. Hold on. I'm going to determine. Oh, no, never mind, not pause. The doctor was in his best condition and looked especially young. The resemblance between him and Lucy was very strong that such times as they sat side by side, she leaning on his shoulder and he resting his arm on the back of her chair, it was very agreeable to trace the likenesses. The likeness. He had been talking all day on many subjects and with unusual vivacity. Pray, Dr. Manette, said Mr. Darnay as they sat under the plane tree and he said in the natural pursuit of the topic in hand, which happened to be the old buildings of London. Have you seen much of the tower? Lucy and I have been there, but only casually. We have seen enough of it to know that it teems with interest, little more. I have been there, as you remember, said Darnay with a smile, though reddening a little angrily, in another character and not in a character that gives facilities for seeing much of it. They told me a curious thing when I was there. What was that? Lucy asked. So when he was in a tower, Darnay kuno got uh, some information. In making some alterations, the workmen came upon an old dungeon, which had been for many years built up and forgotten. Every stone of its inner wall was covered by inscriptions which had been carved by prisoners. Dates, time, names, complaints, and prayers. Upon a cornerstone in the angle of the wall, one prisoner, who seemed to have gone to execution, had cut as his last work three letters. They were done in some poor in instrument and hurriedly with an unsteady hand. At first, they were read D-I-C, but on being more carefully examined, the last letter was found to be G. There was no record or legend of any prisoner with those initials, and many fruitless guesses were made what the name could have been. At length, it was suggested that the letter was not initials, but was a complete word, dig. The floor was examined very carefully under the inscription, and in the earth beneath a stone or tile or some fragment of paving, 
were found, the ashes of paper <gasps> mingled with the ashes of small leathern case or bag. What the unknown prisoner had written will never be read, but he had written something and hidden it away to keep it from the goaler. So in the Bastille, Kono, when they found it, when they were digging through the walls of the old dungeon, they found they found a carving that said dig. And when they dug, they found ashes of paper and a leather case. My father, exclaimed Lucy, you are ill. Oh, so nireact ang papa. When Darnay was telling the story, he was all of a sudden feeling kind of, he looked ill. He had suddenly started up with his hand to his head. His manner and his look quite, terrifi quite terrified them all. No, my dear, not ill. There are large drops of rain falling and they made me start. We had better go in. He recovered himself almost instantly. Rain was really falling in large drops and he showed the back of his hand with raindrops on it. But he said not a single word in reference to the discovery that had been told of. And as they went into the house, the business eye of Mr. Lorry either detected or fancied it detected on his face as it turned towards Charles Darnay, the same singular look that had been there upon upon it when turned towards him in the passages of the courthouse. He recovered himself so quickly, however, that Mr. Lorry had doubts of his business eye. The arm of the gold... Ah! Sorry. The arm of the golden giant in the hall was not more steady than he was when he stopped under it to remark to them that he was not yet proof against slight surprises as he ever would be, and that the rain had startled him. Tea time and Miss Pross making tea with another fit of jerks upon her and yet no hundreds of people. <gasps> Mr. Carton had lounged in, but he made only two. So now Carton arrived. The night was so very sultry that although they sat with doors and windows open, they were overpowered by the heat. Oh my gosh, Chanel, baby girl. Okay, do you want to go down? Okay, hold on. I'm going to put her down. Wait, baby, huh? <sighs> okay. The night was so very sultry that although they sat with doors and windows open, they were overpowered by the heat. When the tea table was done, they all moved to one of the windows and looked out into the heavy twilight. Into the heavy twilight. Where am I? Okay. Lucy sat by her father. Darnay sat beside her. Carton leaned against a window. Carton leaned against the window. The curtains were long and wide, and some of the thunder gusts that whirled into the corner caught them up to the ceiling and waved them like spectral wings. The raindrops are still falling large, heavy, and few, said Dr. Manette. It comes slowly. It comes surely, said Carton. Okay. Uh, we will pause. Never mind. There was a great hurry in the streets of people speeding away to get shelter before the storm broke. The wonderful corner for echoes resounded with the echoes of footsteps coming and going. Of echoes coming and going. Sorry. I was wondering what Chanel was doing. Yet not a footstep was there. A multitude of people and yet a solitude, said Darnay when he had listened for a while. Okay, pause. And let's go what a night it has been. Hmm. You know what? Don't pause because this is kind of heavily symbolic. Chanel, hold on. I think she's about to do something weird. Okay. Sweetheart, don't be spoiled. Shh. Oh, man, she's so spoiled. I know. It's time for her walk, Mangod, but I'm here. I have to finish this. Baby girl. Okay, come here, come here, come here, come here. Okay, 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 okay. I'm almost done. Okay. It is not impressive, Mr. Darnay, asked Lucy. Sometimes I have sat here of an evening until I have fancied, but even the shade of a foolish fancy makes me shudder tonight when all is so black and solemn. Let us shudder too. We may know what it is. It will seem nothing to you. Such whims are only imp impressive as we originate them. I think they are not to be communicated. I have sometimes sat alone here of an evening, listening until I have made the echoes out to be the echoes of all the footsteps that are coming by and by into our lives. There is a great crowd coming one day into our lives, if that be so, Sidney Carton struck in, struck in, in his moody way. 
The footsteps were incessant and the hurry of them became more and more rapid. The corner echoed and re-echoed with the tread of feet, some as it seemed under the window, some as it seemed in the room, some coming, some going, some breaking off, some stopping altogether in the distant in all the distant streets, and not one with sight. Are all these footsteps destined to come to all of us, Miss Manette, or are we to divide them among us? I don't know, Mr. Daime. I told you it was a foolish fancy, but you asked for it. When I have yielded myself to it, I have been alone, and then I have imagined them, the footsteps of the people who are to come into my life and my father's. I take them into mine, said Carton. I ask no questions and make no stipulations. There is a great crowd bearing down upon us, Miss Manette, and I see them by the lightning. He added the last words after there had been a vivid flash which had shown him lounging in the window. Char, when he said, when he said his spiel, lightning flashed and it kind of showed him. Kachar, char, should we? It's kind of like the Nakita young face and what an effect. And I hear them, he added again after a peal of thunder. Char! And then he said something again and then there was thunder. Here they come, fierce, fast, fierce, and furious. So they were talking about a large multitude of people that's about to enter their lives, Kuno. And they were just kind of talking very cryptically and very kind of semi-prophetically. And we're like, they're coming, they're coming soon. Are we going to accept them? Are we going to divide it among ourselves? It was a rush and roar of rain that he typified, and it, and it stopped him, for no voice could be heard in it. A memorable storm of thunder and lightning broke with that sweep of water, and there was not a moment's interval and crash, and fire and rain until after the moon rose at midnight. The great bell of St. Paul's was striking one in the air, in the cleared air, when Mr. Lorry, escorted by Jerry, high-booted and bearing a lantern, set forth high booted you know what i imagine jerry <laughs> jerry was wearing ariana grande's outfit because <laughs> he had high boots i have to get that image out of my head because now i'm imagining jerry in an ariana grande costume anyway there were solitary patches of road on the way between soho and clerkenwell and mr lorry mindful of footpads always retained jerry for this service though it was usually performed a good two hours earlier what a night it has been, almost a night, Jerry, said Mr. Lorry, to bring the dead out of their graves. I never, I, sh there will be meaning. I never see the night myself, master, nor yet I don't expect to. What would, what would do that, answered Jerry. Good night, Mr. Carton, said the man of business. Good night, Mr. Darnay. Shall we ever see such a night again together? Perhaps, perhaps, see the great crowd of people with its rush and roar bearing down upon them too Ooh, very cryptic but i think the point the point of this chapter is is showing how all of them were kind of forming this this kind of circle of friends circle of people that are really going to affect each other in in great ways so I think that that is the symbol of this, that even the very aloof Mr. Carton was somehow involved in their circle of whatever. So this is uh, kind of the build of the chapter. Okay, so great then. Thank you for listening. I will see you for, let me see, chapter 8, Monsignor in the country okay say bye for now bye <laughs>